I um, I want to do something that will take us a number of different places in the uh, in the next 45 minutes or so, and then I'm hoping, uh, if people aren't too uh, uh, exhausted uh, from their travels, we might talk a bit uh, after the uh, uh, my remarks. And uh, but even more importantly, I'm hoping to raise some questions and thoughts that will give us something to touch on in the next two days as we look at all the different documents, uh, some issues that I hope will recur. The question I, I'm asking is, what, what do people see and what do they experience when they move through urban space? This is really the question I am hoping to think about this evening, and I hope it will resonate with some of the things that we talk about tomorrow. What did Europeans, and particularly Europeans who are not Jewish, which obviously means in this epoch that concerns us, uh, primarily Christians, what did Europeans who were not Jewish, which is to say most Europeans, see and experience as they moved through urban spaces, particularly, but not only, spaces which were often informed by a Jewish presence? And to get us thinking about this, what do people experience? What do they see? What do they experience? You know, what do they notice? How do they take in what they uh, look at or don't look at as they move through urban space? I'm going to begin by talking about two well-known situations, one from the past and one from the present, to help us think about this question. Now, the first and very much of what I say will be familiar to various people in this room. I'm just hoping that not everything I say will be familiar to everyone in this room. The first situation has to do with the German city of Frankfurt am Main in the 17th and 18th century. And here is the classic, well-known image uh, by Matthäus Merian of Frankfurt in the 17th century. Frankfurt was one of the major commercial centers of Germany. As you know, it was also home to the largest Jewish community in Germany. The city was divided into two parts. The major part north of the river Main was the heart of the city of Frankfurt. The southern part, the smaller part, Sachsenhausen, south of the river, and uh, was connected by Frankfurt's only bridge. Now, anybody arriving in Frankfurt from the south, or anybody simply going from one part of town to another, would have uh, crossed the bridge and gone through the Brückenturm, the bridge tower, into the main part of the city. And this raises an interesting Oh, thanks, yeah. This raises an interesting question. What did they experience as they went through this archway into the city of Frankfurt? As many of you will know, what they would see throughout the early modern period, what one saw when one walked through the archway of the Brückenturm, right under here, one saw a painted image. And this is a seven, an 18th century rendering of this famous painted image in the Brooklyn tomb. The upper part of this image depicted the child, Simon or Simon of Trent, whose alleged torture and murder by the Jews of Trent in 1475 was the basis, as all of us know, for one of the most famous and widely known ritual murder trials in early modern Europe. The larger and lower and larger part of this image depicted the image of the Judensau. This was a variant on a well-known um, theme of Jews suckling a pig. The Jewish, this is, uh, I, without even going into all the details, but you can see this is all this horrific. The, we know these are Jews, obviously, by the yellow ring that Jews in Frankfurt and many other cities were required to wear. And this is the image of uh, the Jews engaged in truly disgusting uh, physical acts with, uh, with a pig. Uh, 
The Jewish community of Frankfurt, not surprisingly, found this Schandbild, this diff defamatory picture, to be highly objectionable, and it was widely reported that the Jews in the course of the 17th century had offered substantial sums of money to the magistrates of Frankfurt to remove this painting. But this was not done. In fact, the rulers of Frankfurt at some point in the 17th century actually ordered the image to be repainted and refurbished. And as late as the mid-18th century, though it had slightly faded, this image was still visible to any person who crossed this bridge, which was an absolutely central traffic route uh, for anyone going north or south from the one part of Frankfurt to the other. And the question is, what would this image have said to non-Jews who were entering or leaving Frankfurt? What did this make them think? How did they experience this image? And of course, part of the problem that I'll be addressing is while we know about the image, we know about its history, we don't know as much as we wish we knew about what people actually felt or experienced when they passed by this image on every trip from one side of the river to the other. Now I want to consider a second situation from the present day. This will also be familiar to many of you, and I'm sure there are people here who have seen this. If you go to Berlin today, you might well find yourself in the Bayerisches Viertel. This is a densely populated residential neighborhood in the western part of the city, just south of the Kurfürstendamm. As you wander around this neighborhood, you will come across numerous signs attached to street signs or to lampposts. And this is a picture I myself took a few years ago when I was in Berlin. And you can see, it doesn't come across too clearly, but there's numerous signs of this type. This particular sign, which is right in the main square of the Bayerisches Viertel on the Bayerischer Platz, this sign says, Juden dürfen am Bayerischen Platz nur die gelb markierten Sitzbänke benutzen. Jews at the Bayerischer Platz may only sit on benches marked with yellow stripes. And as you wander up and down the streets, you will see on these street, you know, this is a, 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 a lamppost or a street sign. This is attached to these lampposts. You will see signs that say things like, Juden dürfen keine Zeitungen und Zeitschriften kaufen. Jews are not allowed to buy newspapers or magazines. Juden sollen keine Seife und Rasierseife mehr erhalten. Jews are no longer allowed to have soap or shaving cream. Juden dürfen nach 8 Uhr abends im Sommer 9 Uhr ihre Wohnungen nicht mehr verlassen. Jews may not leave their homes after 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. in the summer, and so on. In some cases, a small date appears under the sign, uh, typically a date with something like 1-9-1939, 1 1942 and so on. There's actually 80 of these signs that can be seen on lampposts all over that neighborhood of Berlin. They began to be put up in 1993. And soon after, the first signs began to be affixed to these lampposts, and people who were sort of walking around the neighborhoods discovered these signs, complaints were made to the Berlin police that these signs violated Germany's current laws, which stringently forbid the public expression of any anti-Semitic sentiments. The police immediately ordered these signs to be removed, but after a further cycle of explanations and negotiations, all the signs were re-erected, and these 80 signs are now to be seen all over that neighborhood of Berlin. Now, these signs were not installed, as some people initially thought, by anti-Semites. Quite the contrary. They were a, a manifestation of something one actually sees all over Berlin which is neighborhood-based, neighborhood-based Holocaust memorials. This particular memorial is called Orte des Erinnerns, Places of Remembrance. The designers of this memorial believed that these signs, all of which summarize laws and regulations enacted during the Third Reich, would be a more powerful reminder of the horrors of Nazi anti-Semitism than the conventional memorial uh, that you see in many Berlin neighborhoods respectfully listing the names of people who had been deported. As part of the 
a compromise by which the signs were reinstalled after the first complaint were made to the police, uh, a little sign was affixed to the bottom of these 80 signs, which says in very, very small lettering that these are uh, uh, part of a Holocaust memorial, but they are hardly visible. You really have to peer to even notice this, let alone read it. Whereas this sign, Jews are not allowed to sit on any benches in this square except the ones painted yellow, are visible to anyone. Now, this memorial has become quite famous. Many people have written about it. But almost everything I've read about this memorial was written by somebody who first experienced it, exactly as I did, after having heard about it, consciously going to the Bayerisches Viertel and, and knowing that they would see these signs. I have yet not found anything I could read about how these signs are experienced by people who simply wander into the neighborhood and suddenly see these signs for the first time, particularly people who happen to belong to any of Berlin's huge number of, of people of foreign origin, Turks, Iranians, Kurds, and the like, so foreign visitors. Now, a lot of these people who either visit Berlin or live in Berlin uh, may know very little of German history, may not have a cultural context in which to place these signs, and wandering down the streets, you know, you see a sign, or you're just learning German, or maybe you don't read German, but your children do, and show off how they can read. Hey, Jews may not sit on any bench in this neighborhood unless it's painted yellow. Well, it's worth thinking about how do people experience what they see and observe. And we know very little about it. We know very little about how the people who walk through this urban space actually received and interpret what they say there. And this has to do with the present. This has to do with now. How much harder it is to ask the same questions of the past. Now, we actually know very, very much about the content of urban space in early modern Europe, what the built environment consisted of, how and why it changed over time, what kind of conflicts uh, arose about the use of the built environment. There are contemporary illustrations and maps, such as the image of Frankfurt that I showed you. Uh, there are actually magnificent wooden models of many entire cities of the 17th uh, century. There's a wealth of archaeological findings. And of course, there's enormous written record, parts of which we'll be talking about uh, tomorrow. Descriptions of cities, neighborhoods, administrative records, legal proceedings, and so on. But we know much less about how people in early modern Europe actually experienced, interpreted, and understood the urban spaces through which they moved day after day. Nor, and here's a, I have to confess this, nor is this talk going to confess, uh, going to cast very much light on this subject. I want us to just think about the issue of what, what people see when they, or saw when they moved through urban space without claiming to come up with a very profound set of answers. But I do want to suggest some categories, and I want to give some examples to help us think about this issue as a background for the kind of things we'll be talking about for the next two days. And I better begin by saying something about what I think urban space really means, because this is the title of the conference, includes this phrase, urban space. You might think it was obvious, but um, I really want to emphasize that I'm not using this term, and I don't think any of us are going to be using this term, but we'll find out, uh, in a metaphorical sense. Now, you might be surprised, but it can be used that way. I have to confess, I was a bit disappointed a few months ago, and I got a copy of a recent article, which I recommend, uh, by Stefan Wenderhorst, with a very tantalizing title, Imperial Spaces as Jewish Spaces. Now, knowing that Wenderhorst is a great expert on Frankfurt, I assumed that this might be full of material about such things as the moment in 16... 10, 1616, uh, when after the Fettmilch uprising, during which the Jews had been banished from the ghetto of Frankfurt, they were, on the orders of the Holy Roman Emperor, restored to the ghetto, this small uh, neighborhood of which uh, is located here, and we'll talk more about it. And in fact, of course, you have a wonderful map of the ghetto from seven, uh, 1711 in the, in the uh, booklet. Uh, when the Jews were restored to the ghetto in 1616, one of the conditions that were ma was, was made was that the imperial insignia, the eagles, the double eagle representing the power and authority of the Holy Roman Emperor, 
would be attached to the gates of the ghetto to state that this Jewish space was also imperial space. And I thought this article by, by uh, uh, Wenderhorst, imperial spaces as Jewish spaces, would be full of the, you know, the, this kind of the implications of this. Well, uh, it's a great article, actually. Uh, and it's concerned, in case you're wondering, it's, uh, it's concerned with rebutting the traditional argument that in the 17th and 18th century, the Jews of Germany lost their direct connection with the Holy Roman emperors and came entirely under the control of territorial rulers. And he's rebutting this by, by showing the continuing uh, uh, legal and institutional structures through which Jews had a direct relationship with the emperor, not just with the territorial rulers. But the term spaces is used entirely metaphorically. Basically, it turns out what it means is, is it's a translation of the German term Spielraum, room to maneuver. And uh, this, I assume, is not what we are talking about for the next two days, as, as space as uh, a metaphorical um, room in which to carry out one's intentions. I'm assuming, and someone can tell me tomorrow if we're wrong, that we're going to be talking about urban spaces in a physical sense, neighborhoods, streets, building infrastructure, the actual built environment of the early modern city and the way human beings interacted with it. Now, taking that as what I think we're talking about, the classic image of the European city as a walled community densely built up within the walls, surrounded by unbuilt fields beyond the walls, as you get a sense of from this classic image of Frankfurt, this is actually still largely valid in the 17th century. Of course, there were exceptions. There were the emerging metropolises like London or Paris, which were increasingly spreading far beyond the traditional walls into uh, spaces uh, that were uh, uh, no longer confined by walls. But even within the walls, uh, I mean, but even though there were special cases like that, most European cities in the 17th century still looked something like this, and the wall still defined urban space. So the most important distinction is the distinction between the city inside the wall and whatever there was outside the wall, typically gardens and fields, as is very clear in the case of Frankfurt. What's equally important, however, is that even within the walls of European cities, many European cities were significantly divided into differentiated sub-areas. Some of these sub-areas had a very distinct legal status. Many, many cities had special zones, liberties, immunities, freedoms, sanctuaries, in which the authority of the municipal council was limited or, or did not even exist. Uh, one typical example might be the castle precincts of the overlord of the city. Another more common example would be ecclesiastical space, a section of the city controlled by a bishop or a cathedral chapter or a convent or a monastery. And these special zones often had enormous economic implications since a craftsman who did not receive the permission of the municipal government to practice his trade in the city might be able to settle in the cathedral clothes or in one of these other liberties or immunities and practice a trade that he was not allowed to practice two blocks away in the area directly under the control of the municipal council. There could also be some religious significance in that uh, a religion whose practice was forbidden elsewhere in the city might be practiced in those special immune zones. Now, sometimes these zones were understood and accepted by everyone. Sometimes they were highly contested, which is one of the things that makes them very significant. I'm going to get back to that. There were also, of course, urban districts whose legal status fell unquestionably under the authority of the city council, but were differentiated from each other as neighborhoods or parishes with some elements of self-government or self-administration. And I mention this is a very fundamental point. I'm almost embarrassed to say that to a group of professional historians. But I wanted to make this point about the spatial organization of cities, the existence of special immune zones with a different legal regime, and the existence of neighborhoods and so on, which were unambiguously under the control of the city council but had some elements of self-government because of the question of how do we put Jewish ghettos and Jewish neighborhoods into these categories. I think of Jewish ghettos and Jewish neighborhoods as falling someplace between these two categories. 
they were not immune zones in the classic sense because ultimately they fell under the control of the municipal authorities. But they were not just neighborhoods either or in the way that parishes might define neighborhoods because of the extremely distinct economic and religious regime and the exceptionally high level of self-administration, often evident in Jewish neighborhoods or Jewish ghettos. So this is kind of a question that I hope we'll be touching on in various forms in the next two days, the special character of Jewish zones and Jewish neighborhoods. Now, the just about one of the most clearly demarcated of these zones in any place in Europe, and one of the most famous, is, of course, the well-known case of the ghetto of Frankfurt. The ghetto of Frankfurt, I pointed out a few moments ago where it is, and of course uh, there are people in this room who are very, very familiar with uh, this, but um, maybe some of you are not. The ghetto of Frankfurt, which is located here, um, this is what it looks like in close up in this classic image from 1628. Here you see very unambiguously and clearly, you see the three gates of the ghetto. He one, two, three, uh, just hidden behind this tower, but these are the three gates of the ghetto, which has, of course were locked from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown, uh, and then locked again all of Sunday because of the Christian Sabbath. So two out of the five days of the week, basically, the Jews were confined to the ghetto, and uh, uh, the ghetto is a, a very clearly defined walled area, which uh, many of you will know uh, when it was established in 14. 62 had a population of maybe just a few hundred by the end of the uh, 18th century uh, had, uh, had a population well over 3,000 uh, crammed into uh, a very limited amount of physical space inside Frankfurt and I will get back to the Frankfurt ghetto but I wanted to kind of identify this as one of those clearly defined zones within the larger city. But let me move on from the definition of urban space to the question of people moving through urban spaces. Now, most of the people who lived in Europe were obviously non-Jews. Most of the movement of human beings through European urban space was obviously movement by non-Jews. And most of the time, obviously, and even with cities with large Jewish populations, most urban movement had nothing to do with Jews. But I want to think a little generally about moving through cities and then, of course, think about moving through those parts of cities which in some form or other might be thought of as Jewish space. Again, as a kind of definition, we could say that movement in urban space can take two basic forms. Movement in urban space can be large-scale, collective, organized movement, or it can be individual, random uh, one-on-one, -on -one, a small-scale movement. Now, among historians, large-scale, collective, organized movement of significant numbers of people is what is best known and best studied. I'm sure all of us are familiar with the importance of processions in early modern urban life, whether these are civic or religious or funerary processions. They were a major theme in early modern cities. And, of course, we know that every aspect of these processions, who participated in them, in what order they marched, where the procession began, where it paused, where it ended, could be fraught with symbolic meaning. We also know that because of the tremendous symbolic power of the processions themselves and the places where traditionally processions stopped for one reason or another, uh, they could give rise to conflict, they could be reconfigured to serve political ends. This is a familiar theme, but I wanted to, I wanted to illustrate it simply by taking, you know, there's so many examples of this, but just to kind of concretize our, our thinking about processions as a form of movement through urban space. I'm going to take one example, and the only reason I'm going to take it is I came across it recently and thought it was very interesting. I wanted, this is the example of processional movement through the city of Naumburg an der Saale, which is a city in, in eastern Germany, and a scholar uh, whom I don't know, but I wish I did, named Inike Justiz, has studied this uh, quite interestingly. Processional movement in the Reformation era in uh, Naumburg an der Saale. 
basic point is that Naumburg was the seat of a bishop, and like many such cities in the late Middle Ages, there was a division of authority. The main part of the city, the larger part of the city, was governed by the city council. And the uh, smaller, not that much smaller, but the somewhat smaller part of the city, this area, was controlled by the cathedral chapter. So this is the cathedral. The cathedral chapter had the governmental authority in this area, which was known as the Domfreiheit, the cathedral immunity, the city council, uh, the town hall is around here, and this is the largest church in their section, the St. Uh, Wenzel's Kirche. Uh, the city council basically governed the larger part of the city. But not only did the cathedral chapter govern a very substantial part of Naumburg, but the bishop insisted that the city council, which ruled the rest of the city, actually derived its authority from him. And this was a... Uh, uh, something that was generally accepted in the late Middle Ages. The, the main part of the city was surrounded by a wall and gates, and the magistrates controlled the movement in and out of their part of the city through the gates. But once a year, when there was the uh, moment in the annual cycle for the installation of new council members, a procession of cathedral canons took place along the main street, the Hegengasse, through their uh, part of the town, through the gates, across the little bridge, into the marketplace, and then to the St. Wenzel's Church, where the canons formally confirmed the installation of the new city council as a way of indicating their ultimate, the bishop's ultimate authority. Okay, this has gone on for a long, long time. Now comes things get interesting, because now comes the Reformation. During the 1530s, the main part of the city this is Eastern, this is Saxony, where a lot of this was happening, not far from, you know, Wittenberg and all those places. Uh, so during the 1530s, uh, the main part of the city turned Protestant, but of course the cathedral district remained entirely Catholic. Then in 1541, the old bishop died. The local regional authority, the regional ruler, the elector of Saxony, this is, you're familiar with all this from the Luther story, used his influence to prevent the bishop, the old Catholic bishop, from being replaced. And the city magistrates took this as a signal that it was time for them to liberate the cathedral district from Catholic control. So a procession was held, and it was a very carefully staged counter-procession. It was led by the Protestant minister. And what the Protestants population of the main part of the city did, under the leadership of the chief Protestant pastor, was to stage a counter-procession that was a mirror image of the procession that for, you know, whatever, hundreds of years had gone this way. They went this way to the, from the St. Wenzel's Church to the cathedral. This procession included not only the pastor, not only the members of the city council, also the teachers and schoolboys of the city's main school. It arrived at the cathedral, and then, because the cathedral canons resisted what was demanded of them, it concluded with violence. The citizens arrived at their destination. The canons would not let them in the cathedral. They smashed down the cathedral doors, removed the religious images, destroyed the candlesticks, you know, iconoclasm and so on, and claimed the church for the Protestant cause. And this basically meant the whole city was now Protestant. But that didn't end things, because five years later, in 1546, during the Schmalkaldic War, the city was taken by a Catholic prince who immediately installed a Catholic bishop. The bishop arrived. Immediately, he knew the history. He insisted on a grand procession to retrace the route that the citizens had taken five years earlier, but this time as an act of contrition to beg forgiveness. So instead of going from here to there, he made the citizens again gather at the St. Wenzel's Church, but the mayor and the citizens had to then begin their march at the church march up the street to the cathedral, arrive at the cathedral, but this time, instead of smashing down the doors, they had to beg for forgiveness from the bishop, attend a mass at the cathedral, and then march back to the Wenzel Church, retracing the traditional route by which the subordination 
of the city to the bishop had been symbolized, go back to the Wenzel church where they paid homage to the bishop as overlord of the city. Then, a few weeks, weeks later, the military tide turned and a Protestant army regained control of the city. The bishop fled. Now we're all primed to expect another ritual procession. No such thing happened. This time the Protestants said the heck with any processions, and they simply stormed into the cathedral district, plundered the houses of the cathedral canons, and that's how the story ended. So one thing that happens is there's a point up to which processions are seen as having enormous ritual significance and a point at which the people say the heck with all that, we know who our enemies are, and they plunder the other part of the town. But it illustrates that crossing between the two zones of the city, something that under normal circumstances happened hundreds of times a day as people simply went back and forth on their business, could at moments of political and religious significance become highly self-conscious action. Now, this kind of mixture of religious and political elements in processions that we see in Naumburg is entirely typical of European cities. And we're familiar with, I, you know, most of us are familiar with all sorts of literature taking all sorts of different forms about the meaning of processional life in European uh, cities and how urban spaces, how people go from one shrine to another, one politically charged site to another, the gestures they make and so on. What about Jews? Just in passing. Now, obviously, prior to emancipation, Jewish processions were unheard of in the everyday streets of European cities. We get these in the 19th century. It begins to be, you know, a new synagogue is founded and you will get an actual uh, procession of the, you know, the kind uh, where the, the Torahs are brought from the old synagogue to the new, and this gets sanctioned by the magistrates and so on. That, that's all post-emancipation. We're not going to see this normally before 1800 or so. There are, in fact, enormous restrictions on any form of collective movement by Jews in non-Jewish urban space. The famous Stettigkeit of Frankfurt, which was issued in 1616 following the suppression of the Frankfurt, the Fettmilch uprising, sympathetic as the imperial authorities were to the Jews and in restoring them to their traditional homes in the ghettos, they also put enormous restrictions on Jewish movement. We could talk about that another time. But one of the clauses of the Stettigkeit of 1616 was that no more than two Jews could ever walk together through the main parts of Frankfurt. But there was one kind of Jewish procession which did take place in European cities and is worth mentioning because I'm thinking, and again, it'd be great if people can contradict that tomorrow or even tonight, uh, uh, there's one kind of procession that takes place in European cities that is, in fact, uh, going through the non-Jewish neighborhoods of Jewish cities and in a processional form, and that is funeral processions. And this is because so often the cemeteries were not in the Judengasse or the Jewish neighborhood. I guess in uh, uh, Bernie can tell us uh, later, if, you know, about you know in, in Venice where this involves gondolas and so on. It must have. But what you get in um, in uh, a lot of in German cities, you can get a funeral procession. This this happens to be a uh, Worms, and Worms uh, was a city in which uh, the Jewish uh, cemetery was located a good half mile or so from the edge of the Judengasse. The Judengasse is around here. The cemetery is up here. And to get the from the from the uh, uh, Jewish ghetto to the uh, to the cemetery involved a, a procession which was formally acknowledged by the authorities as something the Jews had a right to do. The Jews had a firmly established right to go in procession through the city to the cemetery to bury their dead. In fact, although at all other times Jews were forbidden to leave the Judengasse during Christian holy days, an exception was made in the case of funerals. Christmas, Easter, Pentecost were the, the only days on which a Jewish funeral procession could not go through the city. Any other day, even if it was a Sunday or a a Christian holiday, the Jews had a, an established right to take their dead to the cemetery. Now, to protect the Jews from any disturbance, there was an also an old established right for a, the representatives of a particular noble house, the Kemmerer von Dalburg, uh, 
to have their heralds escort the Jewish funeral procession from the gates of the ghetto to the cemetery. Well, obviously, the Jews had to pay a fee for this service, uh, so it was largely just a, a money-making proposition for the Kemera von Dalburg, but it was a form of collective movement that Christians would have experienced, the only, I think, the only form of processional movement by Jews through the non-Jewish parts of a European city was funeral procession. Okay. That's some things I wanted to say about collective movement, to kind of set up this category of collective, organized, processional movement through cities. I want to talk about the other kind of movement through urban space, because a much more frequent movement through urban space is obviously the movement of individuals or, or small groups of people. Basically, if we think about it, there are four modes of movement by individuals or small groups through the urban space of early modern Europe. Horse, coach, water, or on foot. I mean, either you go by coach, you go by horse, you go by water, or you go on foot. Right? There may be other, I mean, but I think that's about it. Now, we got to think that close to 200 million human beings lived part or all of their lives in some European city or another between 1500 and 1800. And of all of these 200 million human beings who lived some or all of their lives in European cities of the early modern era, there's actually, to the best of my knowledge, and I'd be thrilled if someone can contradict me, to the best of my knowledge, there is still only one person of whom we can say that for a sustained period of time, we know about every single movement that this person made through the city in which he lived. Day after day, for almost 10 years, for every single day in that 10-year period, I'm of course speaking of Samuel Pepys, a celebrated English naval administrator of the late 17th century, who as you know, from January 1st, 1660 to May 31st, 1669, kept this meticulous daily diary recording everything he did everything he observed, everything he thought, and his precise movements from point to point through the city of London and the means by which he got from one place to another. So if we are even going to think about moving through the early modern city, it's impossible not to mention Samuel Pepys. Now, Pepys, this is a, a very simplified map of London. There are two wonderful, uh, one general map, uh, uh, from right after the fire on one uh, of, of 1666 and one uh, 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 map of a particular neighborhood in, in the, the conference booklet, which of course goes into much bigger detail, but for what I want to say this will have to do is a very general map of London in the early modern era. And I want to just think a little about some of Pepys's movements and the kind of movements he made through the city, through urban space. Pepys lived very near his office. His office, he worked at the Navy office, and he lived for most of the diary period in a, in a house that was almost part of the, uh, owned by the Navy office and part of the Navy office uh, uh, kind of uh, precincts, very near the Tower of London. And the fact is, some days, his movements consisted of nothing but going, you know, just up the street to the office and coming home. Uh, there were some days when Pepys was so busy, that's about as much movement as he did. But Pepys was a very restless guy. And uh, such days were enormously rare. Very often he had to go to Westminster on official business. This is a Whitehall, is the palace of the king. Westminster was the, many of the government offices were. Very often he stopped at the Royal Exchange, which is here, because this is where uh, uh, not only, this is where you got the latest news, you found out what was going on, you, he did a lot of errands there. He went elsewhere in the city to meet people, to buy things in search of entertainment. He's always going to plays, as you know, he's always, uh, he's, he's chasing women, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but he moves all through the city of London, and for any day, for ten years, you could actually trace his movements on a map of London, which I'm not going to do for a ten-year period. Don't worry, I'm going <laughs> to take two examples. Uh, sometimes he actually went off this map. He took some trips, of course. But even in a ba day when he's basically based in London, there were times when he went off this map. And one important example, which I'm going to give you is during the period of the Great Plague of 1665, he had sent his wife down river to Woolwich, which is someplace down there, uh, for safety uh, to get her out of the major plague zone, although he had to continue doing his work. 
and there were also major shipyards at Deptford, which was about here, where as a naval administrator, he often had to check on things. So let me give you his movements. For Tuesday, July 18th, 1665, this is from Pepys's diary. So he's starting out here, up and to the office, where all the morning. And so to my house, so go back here, and eat a bit of victuals, and so to the change, where little business and a very thin exchange, and so walked through London to the temple, where I took water for Westminster to the Duke of Albemarle to wait on him, and so to Westminster Hall, there paid for my news books and did give Mrs. Mitchell, who was going out of town because of the sickness and her husband, a pint of wine. It's also because their, their daughter was one of his mistresses at the stay in good with them. And so uh, so W. Warren coming to me by appointment, we by water home, so that would be all the way back here, under London Bridge, which is nothing trivial. The currents are very rapid under London Bridge. You need a good ferryman to get you under London Bridge. So we home. Uh, uh, by the way, discoursing about the project I have of getting some money and doing the king good service too about the mass dock at Woolwich, which I fear will never be done if I do not go about it. After dispatching letters at the office, I by water down to Deptford, which is about here, where I stayed a little while, and by water to my wife, Woolwich, whom I have not seen for five or six days, and there supped with her and mighty pleasant and saw with content her drawings, and so to bed mighty merry. That's quite a bit for a day, you know, if you think that he's going on foot uh, and by water. Um, there are other passages in which he comments in much more detail on what he observed. Now, I'm going to read a passage which I know is familiar to many of you. Todd will know. You've probably read this to your own students. I don't know how many times, but maybe there's someone in the room who's not familiar with this passage. How, uh, how Pepys spent the day and what he observed on Wednesday, October 14th, 1663. Up and to my office, so he's the same thing, he's starting out home, up and to my office, where all the morning and part of it Sir J. Minnis spent, as he do everything else, like a fool reading the anatomy of the body to me, but so sillily as making me uh, understand anything that I was weary of him. And so I, towards the change, towards the change, and met with Mr. Grant, and he and I to the coffee house, the coffee house is not identified, but almost all the coffee houses were in that area of exchange, to the coffee house where I understand by him that Sir W. Petty and his vessel were coming, and the king intends to go to Portsmouth to meet it, thence home, back home, and after dinner, my wife and I, by Mr. Rawlinson's conduct, to the Jewish synagogue, which is located about here. The, Jew the synagogue in Creechurch Street, which was quite new, having been re-established about six years earlier when the Jews, of course, were readmitted to England in 1657. So he's gone to the office, he's then uh, uh, gone to the change, went back home, had dinner, and then a friend or someone who knows something takes him to the synagogue, where the men and boys in their veils and the women behind a lattice out of sight, and some things stand up, which I believe is their law, in a press to which all coming in do bow and at the putting on their veils do say something, to which others that hear him do cry Amen, and the party do kiss his veil. Their service all in a singing way, and in Hebrew. And anon their laws that they take out of the press are carried by several men, four or five several burdens in all, and they do relieve one another. And whether it is that every one desires to have the carrying of it, I cannot tell. But thus they carried it around the room while such a service is singing. And in the end they had a prayer for the king, which they pronounced his name in Portugal, but the prayer itself, like the rest, in Hebrew. But Lord, to see the disorder, laughing, sporting, and no attention but confusion in all their service, more like brutes than people knowing the true God would make a man forswear ever seeing them more, and indeed I never did see so much or could have imagined there had been any religion in the whole world so absurdly performed as this. Away thence, with my mind strongly disturbed with them, 
by coach now, he's going to leave it to the synagogue, by coach now, and set my wife in the Westminster Hall. So many went all the way from the synagogue by coach to down the Strand to uh, Westminster Hall, where he leaves his wife, and I to Whitehall. And there the Tangier Committee met, but the Duke and the Africa Committee meeting in our room. We met in another room with chairs set in form, but no table. And there we had very fine discourses of the business. And so to fetch my wife, and so to the new exchange, which is in the Strand around here, about her things, and called at Thomas Pepys the Turners, which is near St. Paul's, so they're going back from Westminster, probably on foot, because he doesn't say otherwise, uh, to the... Uh, pick up his wife's things in the new exchange, then to a cousin's uh, place near St. Paul's, and bought something there, and so to supper and to bed. Now, this passage is worth a few comments. As regards Pepys' movement, notice this time he didn't go by water, but he makes this one long journey by coach, and the rest of his journey is on foot. But obviously his comments on the visit to the synagogue are, are going to be of particular interest to a, a, a group like this. So in the course of this incredibly busy day where he's got all this other business, he stops at the synagogue for uh, attending the service. Not the first time he'd been there. He'd actually visited the synagogue in 1659 before the diary begins, uh, but it's known from another source. Uh, uh, but this is the only lengthy description that he has. And it's about the only description one could have had because a year later, uh, I, I, I'm told, and you can tell me if I'm right about this, but the, uh, uh, and others, there's other London experts here, but I gather that um, a year later, Gentiles were no longer allowed into the synagogue. But in 1663, they were still host, allowing Gentiles to observe. As for the service itself, it's long been established by a simple calendar comparison that uh, what Pepys observed was not just an ordinary service, but a Simcha Torah service, which interestingly takes place in the early afternoon. Someone, I'd like to talk to someone about this. Why? It's after his dinner, which is around noon. So the Simchat Torah service is taking place, must be 1 or 2 p.m. Something, I don't know. I'd love to figure out what that's about. But anyway, in his description of the service, this is what I want you to think about, his description of the service. On the one hand, we're seeing what Pepys is famous for, this enormously precise powers of observation that Pepys had. I mean, his, his real observing things with the, with the, you know, with the, you know, how that people kiss someone's talit and so on. You know, it's just this, this enormous powers of observation in a milieu that he is, is basically totally unfamiliar with. We know exactly what he's describing. The art, the Torah, the nature of the service, the singing, the chanting, and so on. Yet at the same time, it's absolutely clear that Pepys walked into the synagogue with a preordained set of expectations about what he was going to see. He walks in expecting to see the absurd practices of people who do not worship the true God. So he's simultaneously giving a completely open-minded description of what he actually sees and an entirely preordained description of what he expected to see that was the absurd practices that would trouble his mind, as indeed they did for a few, you know, little while until he got absorbed in the other things he did that day. And what his experience underscores is the fact that observation arising from the experience of moving through in urban space, whether indoors or outdoors, these observations, never, even for an exceptionally perceptive and open-minded person like Pepys, these observations can never be entirely neutral. They're always going to be shaped by pre-existing categories and assumptions about cities and their inhabitants and this is something we have to uh, keep in mind when we think about what is said about what people see when they move through urban space. Now, Pepys is unique in the way he recorded all of his movements day after day for such a remarkably long period of years. But, of course, we have other people who move through urban space and recorded their experiences and observations. And I'm going to now confine myself in what, and you'll be glad to hear this phrase, the closing part of my talk, to one particular kind of movement through urban space. I want to discuss the experiences and observations of certain non-Jews who walked either for official reasons or simply out of 
curiosity through Jewish spaces in their cities. Um, this has to do with the city of Worms, which I've already mentioned, which had the second largest Jewish community in Germany. So here's Worms again. Uh, has the Worms, uh, the Worms uh, Judengasse. And the particular episode that I want to just alert your attention to, unless you are devoted readers of the family of the, the history of the family quarterly, uh, was something that took place on Tuesday and Wednesday of the 3rd and 4th of July, 1610. On Tuesday and Wednesday, the 3rd and 4th of July, 1610, officials of the municipal government of Worms carried out a formal inspection or visitation of the Judengasse of Worms, what they called an ordentlichen Umgang, in which they went von Haus zu Haus. And at each house they inspected the premises, counted exactly how many rooms the house had, and determined exactly how many people lived there and how they were related to each other. There were about a hundred houses in the ghetto, so there were, uh, uh, well, I figure, a uh, two-day visitation, must have been about 50 houses a day. And they then recorded in detail all the salient facts about each house, both the people living there and the organization of rooms. So this is a typical page from the visitation record. This is the kind of stuff we'll be talking tomorrow. And the only reason we won't be talking about this document is that I already published about it. Uh, but this was, so here's house number nine, and just, uh, you know, zum Schlüssel, the house of the key. So you get a, get a little idea just what's in this source. Um, here is the house of the key, and you can see for yourselves the detail with which this was recorded. Isaac and Rachel, his wife, have three children, Eva, Chaim, Baruch, all unmarried. They have no foreign goods or foreign Jews with them. Absolutely no foreign servants except for one poor boy. Rooms, two Stuben for Kama, I think the Polish document has this whole issue of heated and unheated rooms, and this is the same thing here. So Stuben are heated rooms, Kama are unheated rooms. Uh, one courtyard, uh, vaulted cellar, gives six golden as his house rent to the Honorable Council. He gives two golden to the Jewish community. So this is what we know about uh, every single house in the ghetto of Worms in 1610. And from this, I, it's really, I actually have to tell you, I, 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 I use this source more as a, as a source for Jewish demography. That's why it ended up in the history of the family, uh, to get, you know, the mean and median household sizes, sizes of families without the servants, with the servants, and so on. So all those figures are in there. I didn't dwell as much as perhaps I should have on that other issue of the actual physical organization, the size of the houses, the relationship between the size of the house and the uh, number of people living in the house, which is not always obvious because it also had a lot to do with the wealth of the inhabitants and so on. A few weeks later, there was a second visitation, this time specifically and only to check each house for possible infractions of the building code. And the main infraction of the building code was the failure to properly maintain a hanging sign and every house had to have a sign with the name of the house. And uh, uh, in a few cases, in many cases, the signs were either um, had fallen into disrepair or were not freely swinging as was required by the municipal ordinance, and that had to be repaired. But as I say, I use these visitation records more for the demographic purposes. However, what's interesting is that between the lines, this is a very cut and dried kind of source, but between the lines, you do get an image of these hard-working Christian officials on hot summer days knocking on every door, and every now and then you see basically they understand what they're doing. And I say that because I'm going to get on to something which may touch on that. They understand what they're doing. They understand that often the uh, 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 Jews were hosting servants and scholars, poor students from other places, and they kind of... But every now and then there are are things that puzzle them, things about Jewish practice, uh, 
you know, you get a thing about, you know, in fact, there are three cases, I don't know, I shouldn't dwell on this because I don't want to talk about something else, but the three cases of babies where they were told, was born this very day, seems very unlikely. <laughs> three babies born this very day. I'm assuming it's because the families hadn't reported them yet, as they were supposed to do, and they tried, you know, the baby born three weeks earlier. Well, anyway, why haven't you reported it? Well, it was just born today, didn't have time to report it. So three babies, and in one case, they say, uh, um, uh, a baby girl not yet circumcised, which, uh, not nicht beschnitten, which also doesn't quite, <laughs> I don't know what they were thinking. So you see them kind of a little unsure of some of what they were observing. But uh, what is, the real point is that on the whole, the tone of their reports is quite matter of fact. There's no sense of them going into the ghetto and entering a foreign world. They were familiar with the ghetto. They went in and out. There was business to be done there. They knew who the Jews in their community were and so on. And the reason I say that is that I, I think you get a somewhat different impression, not only when you move, as I will, to kind of conclude things, from Worms to Frankfurt, but as you move from the 17th to the 18th century. Because in Frankfurt, the Judengasse, which had been there since 1462, the Judengasse becomes something of a tourist attraction in the later 17th century and increasingly in the 18th century. This was unthinkable in, in Worms or in Frankfurt in the early 17th century. I mean, the idea of going to the Judengasse for any reason other than some enormously practical reason was unthinkable. But in Frankfurt, in the 17th and then especially in the 18th century, the Judengasse, the ghetto, begins to become a kind of um, semi-sensational tourist attraction. Yeah, the ghetto was certainly a very um, memorable feature of the city, but it comes to be seen as a kind of forbidding location, but also an enticingly forbidden location where Jews would not naturally feel at home but about which, where non-Jews, excuse me, where non-Jews would not naturally feel at home, but about which they seem to have a profound curiosity. You almost get the sense that in the eight, course of the 18th century, the ghetto became increasingly exoticized in Christian eyes. Now, obviously, surely many Christian inhabitants of Frankfurt probably spent their entire lives in the city and never once set their foot in the ghetto. Many visitors, we know this, completely ignored the ghetto. But people did visit the ghetto, and their observations, in the, especially in the 18th century, of what they saw or experienced as they moved through this Jewish space is worth thinking about. And I'm only giving a handful of examples. We could talk all day about 18th century accounts of visits to the ghetto. But I'm just going to give five examples to kind of illustrate this point. Peter Wienand. Peter Wienand is the tutor of a Saxon nobleman named Georg von Fürst, who accompanied his student on the grand tour. So this is the beginning of the grand tour tradition. Accompanies his student on the grand tour. In 1690, he kept the diary, which was eventually published when there was a growing market for this kind of uh, literature in uh, 1739. And this is what he writes, um, translated into English, of course. The Jews in Frankfurt have their own special district within which they live. Their synagogue looks impressive. We went in and felt quite squeezed because the people arrived in great numbers. The Jews in there produced a huge amount of howling and crying so that we almost had to cover our ears. Their women, who occupy a special section, were scarcely less irritating. <coughs> we went among them and certainly saw some very attractive women. We were astonished to see that some of them wore expensive dresses and jewels. On the other side of the river lies the city of Sachsenhausen, which is even more strongly fortified than Frankfurt himself. The two cities are joined by a stone bridge. Along this bridge, one can see carved in the stone the child of Trent, whom the Jews brutally murdered. A few years ago, this image was renovated, even though the Jews offered thousands of taler. The next one is, um, I should say that you know, Vinant was particularly struck by the soundscape of the synagogue, the, 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 what he heard. And the other ones that I'm going to quote, in the 18th century, you get increasingly visitors who walk into the Judengasse and comment indeed on the sound, but particularly on the odors that they're confronting. Something possibly explained by the 
growing sanitation problems of a rigidly confined location which had to accommodate a growing population in the same amount of space that had been ordained for about 100 people in 1462, which is now reaching something like 3,000. Picard Blainville traveled through Europe as the tutor of an English government official's son in the early 18th century, and he described his visit to Frankfurt in 1705. So he begins again with a report about the Schant built in the Brutenturm, which obviously made a big impression. We stopped for a few minutes at the entry to the great bridge of stone, which leads to Sachsenhausen, to see a picture which is a terrible libel against the Jews. We had often heard of it. He then describes this picture in enormous detail and, and then talks about why the mob of Frankfurt believes this absurd story. So he's already uh, taking a critical distance to the picture, but recognizes its continuing influence on people he considers less sophisticated than himself. After this, he and his companions spend a whole day visiting the Judengasse, which he described as very narrow, very narrow, and wretchedly dirty, and he reports that the houses are of a neatness like that of a hog stall. And he goes on, don't imagine I exaggerate, for we had the curiosity to visit half a dozen of them with snuff boxes at our noses. He and his uh, companion sit through a service at the synagogue, which he describes as seeming more like a kitchen than a temple due to its blackened walls and stinking odor. He finds the whole community to be so poor and beggarly that he can't believe the Jews really even had enough money to pay the city council to eliminate the picture under the bridge that they said they wanted a picture eliminated because he doesn't think the Jewish community, from what he has observed, superficially of course, would have even had the resources to pay the amount of money they offered. Andreas Meyer, a well-connected gentleman from Brandenburg, he visited Frankfurt, now this is a big leap, and I'm going to get back to Goethe in, in a moment. Uh, Andreas Meyer, a well-connected Brandenburg gentleman, visited Frankfurt during his travels in 1771. His letters describing the trip, which were published a few years later, he's describing his walk through the ghetto in, in what I, I would call mock heroic terms. Everything disgusting that you could imagine can be found in the tiny district occupied by the vast swarm of poor children of Abraham in Frankfurt. A tiny alley full of dirt and filth, rooms and bedding that are just as miserable as their owners. This is what the inquisitive traveler will find there. Out of sheer curiosity, I had to force myself to visit the nests of these people who, if I may make such a comparison, crawl around like vermin in their stinking habitations. Yet at the very same time, Meyer realizes that the Jews are indispensable for the city's prosperity. He goes quite a, after, he goes quite a bit about how he uses the phrase, they are the nails and pegs that hold together the entire economic system of the city. Now, of course, I have to repeat that many visitors to Frankfurt ignored the ghetto entirely. Johann Georg Keisler, who traveled all over Europe as a tutor, again, one of these tutors to highborn students, he spent a few days in Frankfurt, his four-volume description of his travels from the uh, uh, 1740s about, uh, spent a few days in the, the, the Frankfurt, makes visits all the standard sites, makes no reference at all to the presence of Jews in the city. But other travelers are specifically interested in the Jews but can't bring themselves to enter the gates of the ghetto. And one of them is the American painter, John Trumbull, the famous painter of all those you know, Revolutionary War scenes, who visited Frankfurt in 1786, wrote with great sympathy, this is, you know, enlightenment thinking, writes with great sympathy about the cruelty of forcing thousands of Jews to live in one small street, comments on the filth and misery that he observed there, but he had only peeked through the gates of the ghetto. He didn't venture to actually go inside, which also suggests another form of seeing what you want to see, seeing what you want to see in advance of actually seeing it. But probably the most famous and concluding, therefore, description of the ghetto of Frankfurt in the 18th century is provided not by a traveler, but by someone who grew up in Frankfurt, and that's Johann Wolfgang Goethe, born in Frankfurt in 1749. Like Trumbull, uh, some de decades later, Goethe was fascinated by the ghetto as a, as a youth, 
but at first he was afraid to venture inside. But he finally overcame his he hesitation, and later there is a famous and frequently quoted des uh, description of his experiences. Among the evocative things that stirred me as a boy and as a youth was in particular the situation of the Jewish district known as the Judengasse because it consisted of no more than a single street. The narrowness, the filth, the throngs of people, the accents of an unpleasant language, all this made the most disagreeable impression, even if one just looked in while passing by the gate. It took a long time before I dared to go in by myself, and I did not rush to return after I had first experienced the importunings of so many people who were trying to trade or offer something. And of course, the old stories of the cruelty of the Jews to Christian children kept swimming before my young eyes. Although we had come to think more favorably of the Jews, the huge defamatory painting on an archway under the Brickentor, which was still quite visible, was powerful testimony against them. For after all, this had been put there not as the result of some private ill will, but by public authority. And Goethe goes on to write about how he overcame his initial squeamishness, repeatedly visited the ghetto, attending services at the synagogue, witnessing both a birth and a wedding. But his initial passage, the one I quoted, fits into this long pattern of individuals who entered the ghetto, walking nervously through the narrow, smelly street to form some impression of this exotic enclave. It's actually a kind of emerging Orientalism about the ghetto of Frankfurt. And it reminds us that no Christian entered the ghetto in a neutral frame of mind. Pre-existing attitudes and assumptions about the Jews always shaped the way visitors observed and experienced the ghetto of Frankfurt. So, I've hopped and jumped myself, moving through urban space. I was also moving through a bunch of different topics. Just let me conclude by saying people move through urban space in groups or alone. The question I thought is worth thinking about rather than trying to answer is what do they experience and what do they observe? The answer is partly determined by the actual physical objects they encounter in the built environment, but it's also determined by their awareness of less visible lines of demarcation between urban zones and neighborhoods. And it's very much determined by the uh, assumptions and attitudes that shape the experience of observing and determine which things are even seen and how they are registered. These are the kinds of things that I hope we'll find ourselves talking about and disentangling and confronting over the next two days as we try to mentally walk with Jewish and non-Jewish inhabitants of early modern cities through spaces which are obviously much more familiar to them than they are to us, we're still full of surprises and challenges, even for the people who live their whole lives there. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you.